more and more, we have to, I think, discern between what is valid use of technology for instructional delivery okay. and what is either replacing a skill or distracting from identifying the skill. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I am back for day three with Andrew Pudua. And this is part of our Meet the Cast lineup. It's so much fun getting a chance to talk with these cast members. Um, you know, as we talked about in part one, God has been so gracious to us to just provide us, not just with the people who were in the movie. There are a lot of people who we interviewed who didn't make it in the movie for various reasons. Um, they were all so good. I, it, it was impossible, it seemed, to, to pick the different um, interviews, but it was just really neat to see how the ones that made it in the movie all just worked together. They it just did. flowed. You I mean, could it was incredible. see the Holy Spirit in action there. Yes. Because there were these themes and echoes and developments and you couldn't have planned it. You could right. never have scripted it. Right, yeah. right. That's what's really fun about a documentary. Here's, here's a little thing. I don't know if you know this, um, and most of our listeners probably don't. When you film a documentary, one of kind of the tricks of filming a documentary is that you never give questions ahead of time to the interviewees. Oh. Because if you do, they rehearse their answers. Oh. And then it sounds scripted and it doesn't sound like a natural conversation, like what we're having now. And so we were very careful. I think we only had one person who her husband was adamant. He said, I really want her to have the questions because she's going to just flub the interview if she doesn't. And sure enough, hers was like the most robotic and it didn't make it in the movie. Mm. And she had a lot of good stuff to say, but it just was, you know, like you could tell she had scripted it in her mind and mm -hmm. was trying to get it out of her mouth the way she had thought through it in her mind. And so, so that's kind of a documentary trick oh. is that you, you don't give the questions ahead of time. I will, I will think about that next time I watch a documentary. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. Um, so anyway, we are talking about lessons you've learned in your 30 years of teaching and 30 plus years of teaching. You've been teaching for a while and you have so much great wisdom and insight. Um, when, when we filmed you for the movie, I think your interview was, I think you win the prize actually. Well, aside from Heidi's, but hers was days long. That, that was a whole different process, but of actually sitting down with people, I think we sat down with you for about two and a half hours, um, which was incredible because you were just this wealth of information and Garrett and I just sat there and we were like, wow, this is amazing. And so, um, so I love learning from you. I, I love that you get to be one of those, um, education mentors to myself and to Garrett as well. And to all of these people listening, because you just really do have so much wisdom to share. So I would love for you to continue on with some of the things that you have learned. Okay, well, we talked about it's hard not to do to your kids what was done to you. Right. We talked about it's it's a whole lot more about process than product and that all kids are different. And so we don't have to be attached to textbooks with numbers on the cover and the age of the kid and all that. Right. Uh, and getting past that, part of what we are deeply programmed with just by living right? We don't even have to try to be programmed this way. We're just living is this idea that somehow progressive education would be progress, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the word even supposedly would mean that. Right. Um, progressive progress. But it's one of those words that has been totally hijacked, hmm. like liberal, right? right? Liberal used to mean freedom. Mm -hmm. Right. But now we, we generally don't associate a freer society with right. liberal politics. Um, but this idea of progress and progressive. So um, have we made progress in education? Well, on a very objective, right. statistical data based analysis, right. the huge answer screaming at us is no. Right. So math basic skills math scores mm -hmm. are putting the u.s way way down i don't even know what it is currently but every time it's announced we're further down in the list of developed countries mm -hmm. in math education um certainly um there are objective metrics for reading and writing and that's way down in fact it's been going down for a long time um there was a book published in 1990 
How many years ago was that? 21 years ago. Try 31 years ago. 31, oh, 31 years ago. Years ago. Oh, it's man. okay. <laughs> I'm <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> Plus, I can do mental math. Like right, you I told can do you. mental math. I cannot. Uh, so 30 years ago. <laughs> so in 1990 was published this book called Why Johnny Can't Write mm-hmm. by Myra Linden, Arthur Wimby. Um, and this was a well-documented book and basically said that the writing skills of high school graduates had been going down, had been declining for 20 years. And that was in 1990. Wow. So that's 50, 50 years. years. That's I half, can do that math. <laughs> half a century. Yeah of decline in writing skills of high school graduates specifically. And I think we could say by extension, thinking skills. Mm -hmm. So the problem with progressive education is to fall into the fallacy that new must be better, Mm -hmm. right? Change is always good. That's not true. Right. You can just look at lots of times in history when new and change was not better than what previously existed. So while progressive education always has to have the new thing, we could go back and say, well, what were we doing a hundred years ago Mm -hmm. or 150 years ago or 2000 years ago that was working better than what we're doing today? And we don't, you know, we don't have to go that far back. You can look at colonial slash early America 17 to mid 1800s Mm -hmm. and people had extremely high levels of basic skills right they were literate they were competent they knew history they understood the origin of the thoughts that our country's political system is founded on right and that was everybody that wasn't just people who had higher education in fact a really fun thing to do fun humbling (laughs) a little depressing but fun as I believe you can easily do a web search for Salina, Kansas, 1895, eighth grade graduation exam. Okay. I'm going to look that up. Yeah. Go ahead. Do it. And if it works, put the link in the show notes or something. It's something like that. Um, and so this is a little podunk place in Kansas, 120 years ago, 1895. And you can actually see this exam. And I guarantee you, that no one I know, myself included, could pass this test. Sure. N- n- I would say 98% of college graduates with mm-hmm. with advanced degrees could not pass this right. test. Why? Because it required a level of practical, um, accurate, consistent understanding mm-hmm. of the basics of reading and writing and math that are just haven't been taught for a right. very, very long time. So when someone says, yes, my great, great grandfather had only an eighth grade education, that probably (laughs) means he was educated superior to almost all university graduates today. So, um, you know, now what we're really fighting isn't just the progressive mentality that was in place and starting to erode student performance, Mm -hmm. you know, by 1970, that thing has been supercharged by technology. Right. And so right. now we see in schools this incredible drive mm-hmm. to get more and more technology right. into the classroom. But again, very objective. Right. Research shows and and the book is called The Flickering Mind by Todd Oppenheimer and you know, it's even getting old now, which is too bad because people say oh it's an old book. But he did some amazing traveling around the country, looking at te- high tech schools, looking at zero tech schools, mm-hmm. um, evaluating. And he found consistently an inverse correlation between the amount of technology in the classroom, mm-hmm. i.e. mostly screen-based, computer-based, sure. and basic skills, reading, writing, and math. Right. And, and in the zero tech schools, mm-hmm. like Montessori, Waldorf, there was the highest level of basic skills. Right. And so the subtitle of the book is The False Promise of Technology in the Classroom, I, I believe. And unfortunately, since that book was written, we now have seen horrific things like sure. an entire massive school district, Los Angeles Unified, <laughs> wanting to get iPads or tablets yep. into grade one and two yeah. classrooms. 
Um, and, and this is just going to further erode. Sure. And the problem is, is that, you know, a technology, whatever it is, will atrophy the skill it replaces. So mm -hmm. as soon as you show kids a calculator, as soon as they know that it exists, right. they won't believe that learning math facts has value. Right. So then consequently, they grow up not learning how to think mathematically, right. to see relationships between numbers. If you show them how a spell checker works, they stop believing that learning to spell has value. Right. If you show them, you know, that you can just talk to your machine and run a grammar checker and then it's okay. Right. You know, they won't believe there's any value right. in learning the rules of, of usage and grammar and right. mechanics. And so what we see is an increasingly dependent, mm -hmm. meaning not independent, and poorly prepared mass of people coming out of the the public system for the most part and, right. and other you know private or catholic schools that imitate that system sure sorely unprepared to do what i certainly and maybe even you mm -hmm. would take for granted right and this is going to be a huge problem in the workforce it's yep. going to be a huge it already is a huge problem politically right. So uh, that idea of progressive education, yep. um, we want to not confuse that with progress because it's right. been a very retrograde, unfortunate uh, decline. And I think that's where, you know, our homeschool parents will mostly discover, sure. sometimes as a surprise, but a pleasant surprise, mm -hmm. that the kids they taught at home even in a marginally rigorous way, mm -hmm. right, are way above most of their peers sure. when they hit, you know, whether it's college or, or beyond. Or beyond. Yeah. Interesting. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. What we do at IEW is break through the, the noise of the grammar and the writing prompts, and we say, this is what you do, step by step. And I've witnessed it over and over again, both watching Andrew teach and hearing from parents, this is the best writing program. We've made it so easy and made it really affordable. So any mom can teach writing to their children using our course, and we guarantee it. To try three weeks of free lessons, visit IEW.com. We are back with Andrew. Um, I want to ask a question on what we were just talking about before the break. How do you balance? Because I, I definitely can see, and I, I did read that in the book, you talk quite a lot about um, technology and how that's impacting kids and students today. But, you know, and, and you mentioned actually in the book that even IEW, you know, part of what we do, what our family does with IEW is one of my daughters likes to watch the lessons being taught by you. Mm -hmm. um, and my other daughter likes to me to watch the lesson and then I help her with the lesson, but we still use that technology. Sure. Um, and it, it really is a great blessing to us. So how do we balance? Because there, there are some, you know, I know that there are a lot of options for homeschool parents today. And, and it's one of the things that we recommend sometimes is, you know, if, if you have a lot of kids or if you have to work from home, um, utilize some of the thing, you know, resources that we have with online teaching and things like that. Sure. So how do we balance that to where it's not becoming a hindrance to our children's learning, but being helpful to them? Well, I think there's a big difference between a technological delivery of, of instruction or mm -hmm. information or opportunities for learning. And video is certainly very, very powerful. I never, ever imagined the power of video. In right. fact, as a interesting side, when someone, I was running around teaching writing seminars for a couple of years, and then someone said, well, let's make a video. Hmm. My reaction is that is the stupidest idea <laughs> I have ever heard because who would watch it? Right. It's a seminar. It's a class. You have to be there. You have to look people in the eye. You have to interact. Right. Um, so I never, ever would have imagined that, you know, 10 years later, people would be saying, Oh, my, my son feels like he's right in your class and he raises his <laughs> hand when you ask them a question and he talks to the TV, right? <laughs> so if a picture's worth a thousand words, a video is worth 10 times, a right. hundred times that. But uh, what I'm referring to would be those forms of technology that 
will, as I said, atrophy or cause a decline in the cognitive skills. Okay. Right? Like a calculator or... Right. Or a spell checker or... Right. No, right, right. I'm not okay. saying I don't use a spell checker. Sure. But I use it with the, with the background of knowing. When you use one of these devices without the background of knowing... Right then you have no way of knowing if it's suggestion or correction or right. um, change for you was actually a good one or not. Right. Um, but um, more and more, we have to, I think, discern between what is valid use of technology for instructional delivery okay. and what is either replacing a skill or distracting from identifying the skill. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so we don't want to use things that are going to handicap the learning process, but it's good and okay to use things sure. that are going to advance you know, the learning and process. One of the things I often point out is a fundamental baseline on, on technology and, and humanity mm -hmm. is if you, the human, mm -hmm. are telling your machine what to do, that's the right relationship, right? If the machine is telling you what to do, right. that is the wrong relationship, right? So sure. in business, very often we're using applications and things like spreadsheets and mm -hmm. all sorts of tech stuff, but we are totally in control of that, mm -hmm. right? When you look at a lot of, say, educational software, and not all, but but some of it, a lot of it, it's like a game. It's... It's creating a stimulus response, stimulus response. It's telling the kid what to do next. Right. So that's kind of the baseline idea. And then, you know, the thought that um, that was kind of the conclusion of that book, The Flickering Mind, mm -hmm. I mentioned. Uh, he said, technology amplifies whatever you have. Mm -hmm. So if you have a focused, organized, efficient, productive human being, mm -hmm. You give them technology, they will become more, you know, focused, efficient, productive. Mm -hmm. If you have an unfocused, disorganized, inefficient, and unproductive human being, and you give them technology, <laughs> they will become more that way. Right. And then he leaves the reader with the question, so what's the average 10-year-old like? Yeah, right. You know, they're not naturally focused, focused and productive right. and if, if efficient. Right. They have to learn to be that way. Yeah. And the technology is not necessarily the helpful way right. for them to learn to be that way. Right. Uh, whereas traditionally, you know, even schools, yeah. um, there were requirements. Mm -hmm. that, you know, the system may have been somewhat disordered mm -hmm. and there are things about it I don't like, but it did, you know, have okay, you've got to pay attention, you've got to learn this, you've got to discipline your mind, you've got to practice, you've got to do your math, you know, and there were requirements mm -hmm. to force children to grow in right. that way. Okay. Those are increasingly dissipated in the modern classrooms right. of today. Absolutely fascinating. We have a couple minutes left, um, and I want to hit these last three um, Starting with college, let's talk about that for just a minute. <laughs> well, I know you have strong opinions about. We we this, need as to do we. a whole different <laughs> a whole different podcast on that. But yeah. the idea is, you hear these buzzwords: college and career readiness, mm -hmm. and that as if the college board could create an SAT or a test that would somehow force those things. But you know what I often do is say to parents, "Okay, think if you were a person who had to either teach high school graduates." Mm -hmm or employ and supervise high school graduates, what are some of the things you would like in these people that come to you? Sure. Well, well go ahead. What would hard, you like? Hard work, integrity. Um, I mean, those are the first two that come to my mind. Honesty. Mm -hmm. Those are things that A little don't bit of humility, talk. teachability sure. would sure. be handy. Um, con you know, attentiveness, mm -hmm. concentration. Some people just say, show up. <laughs> right. Which today in today's society, good some, golly, yeah. that's huge. <laughs> now, all of those things, and mm -hmm. we could come up with a list of probably sure. a few dozen, none of those are learned in a textbook. Right. Very few, if any of those, can be learned in a classroom mm -hmm. of 20 some 30 people. Right. Almost none of them 
are on a teacher's teaching plan. Right. And yet those are the things that really matter right. when it comes to college and career readiness. Mm -hmm. All those things, if they are learned, are mostly learned at home and then in opportunities for kids to have real responsibilities, a home business or being in the missions field or working on a political mm -hmm. campaign or doing things that are real right. rather than kind of the artificial experience of high school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we could unpack that a lot, but you right. said we only had a few minutes. We so <laughs> that's the short version, yeah. which is the most important things that kids take into adulthood yeah. for college and career readiness. Yeah have nothing to do with SAT tests or textbooks. Right. And typically homeschool families really um, focus on those things in addition to academics. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've mentioned this on the podcast before we, I have a, a kind of a chore list for my girls in the morning that they have to, you know, do before we start, you know, reading in our morning basket time and stuff. And on that list, I actually have um, that they're to take initiative. It just says initiative. And every day I expect them to take some kind of initiative to do something that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look around I don't care and... what it is. And I have a list for them, you know, on the side of their, their list that gives them some ideas. So if you don't know what initiative to take, look at this There's list, some options. Good. dishes, laundry, you know, clean the bathroom, you know, whatever it might be, because I really want them to be in the habit of not just doing what they're told to do, but being able to just function. Yeah. As an adult, and I think homeschool families really across the board tend to, to be very good at teaching their oh, kids yeah, how to be part of a family and how to take care of a home. Well, and you've got time to you've do that. You've got time. I mean, if exactly. your girls had to be on a bus at 730 right. and came home at 430 or 5 and you're working all day and right. you throw in microwave dinners and yep. vegging in front of the television. Right. Because you're so exhausted from right. all that. Right. You'd have no time to teach those you know, right. what we might call the intangibles sure. of education. Sure. And then they sit in a classroom all day long and come home and have to do three or four hours of homework, depending on the grade right. that they're in. And really, um, you know, we had some friends, I remember their daughter was, she went to public school and she was in probably middle school. She did not know how to do laundry. And I was shocked. I was like, how, how is that even possible that she, you know, my five-year-old does laundry, like literally knows how to put the clothes in the washer and the dryer. She can't reach it yet. But, you know, she knows how to go through the process of doing her own laundry, wash, dry, mm -hmm. fold, put away. And, um, and so it was shocking to me. But then when I realized that same, you know, truth was that she's in school all day and then comes home and does and schoolwork no and she has sports and stuff. She doesn't have time yeah. to learn those, and, those and skills. And certainly, you know, one of the greatest things you can learn as a young person is how to cook. Oh, yes. You know, and I'm so <laughs> thankful to my wife who made sure that all my girls learned how to cook yep. well. Uh, that way, when I go visit them now, I eat really well. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've often said the reason I taught my girls how to cook. Actually, I didn't teach them how to cook. The reason that I have them cook and they've pretty much self-taught <laughs> is because I hate to cook. I hate <laughs> to be in the kitchen. And I always tell them, that's why I had kids. <laughs> yeah. So you can cook for me. Both of my girls, my 10 and 15 year old girls are both better in the kitchen than I am. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible in the kitchen. One of these days, maybe I'll get good at it. But anyway, so, okay, we have two left and um, we'll kind of rush through these. So what are the last two? Well, um, number six is one of Oliver DeMille's keys of great teaching, which is it's actually about you, not them. So if you're in good condition, if you are emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically in good shape, mm -hmm. you can teach well. Mm -hmm. And if you are not, you cannot teach well. Right. And it would, in some cases, be better to just say, sorry, no school today. Yeah. We're going to do other stuff. I need to work on being a good teacher, which mm -hmm. means I need time in all those areas. And I do think that... Um, when moms come into homeschooling, they can kind of burn the candle at both ends, sure. right? Because they're thinking, now I got to be wife and mom, mm -hmm. but now I got to be teacher. Right. And that's just like all the available time that I could possibly have. Right. Um, and ne you need that time to read things that enrich you intellectually. You need mm -hmm. to have good health. You right. know, if your energy is low, how can you do this? Right. Um, and this is true for teachers as well. Sure. Um, and, and I would say, you know, teachers who are also parents, mm -hmm. they can get in that same kind of vice grip. Right. You know, a lot of men get into that too, which is, mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm a dad and I have to work and I'm building this business. And so I need to get up as early as possible and work as long as possible. And that's how I define success. Um, right. Rather than saying, no, I need to take the time it takes to be as good mm -hmm. a person as right. I can be. It, it, both good in the big sense of being a good person, but being in good condition. Right. And then number seven is really love is the key. If, if your students know that they love you, teaching, learning goes better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a lot of stories that I would illustrate this with. So you'd have to read the book right. or <laughs> listen to the, the talk. Um, but I have realized on many occasions, it's actually easier for me to be unconditionally loving, unconditionally supportive, unconditionally appreciative of, enthusiastic about other people's children's effort mm -hmm. and to forget to be that way with my own kids so yeah. it's like yeah you love me i love you we know this so would you just get to work come on we have stuff to do right and so there's that there's that need to consciously remind ourselves that you know children thrive on the experience of active love mm -hmm. whatever that is right and different kids sometimes feel love different ways. We were talking off about, love languages. Uh, about the five love languages yeah. and, and how that's different. So, um, you know, that that's the seventh one. And, you know, as a homeschool parent, how to not assume that just because we're together almost all the time, mm -hmm. that we are affirming that in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And that's true. Uh, you know, once we, I think, if we understand our kids' love languages, and for people who maybe haven't heard of that book, I'll put a link to it. Um, it's one of the most important books I think I've ever read. And um, we actually just were recently talking about that um, on the podcast. And it's so powerful, not just in the relationship between husband and wife, but between parent and child. Oh, because yeah. when you understand how your kids feel loved, you're absolutely right. When they feel loved, they're going to respond to their parents much better than if they feel like mom's always berating them and nagging at them all day long, you know, but if mom can fill that love bucket of mm -hmm. theirs, you know, whether it's, um, you know, quality time or acts of kindness or, uh, you know, what I'm trying to think what Gifts, all of them are gift giving words um, of affirmation, right. And, and uh, physical affection, yeah, yeah. you know, all of those figure out what your kids are. And I mean, there are tests actually, I'll put a link cause we've done a podcast specifically on that. And you can find links to kind of the test to figure out what your kid's love language is. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, um, focus on that. Even if maybe for a week you focus on like meeting your child's love language and then move back into the academics, I think that would make a world of difference. So thank you so much for your time sure. this week. You're an absolute fast, blessing. It? it does go by so very quickly. Um, we are grateful for you and just for the support that you have shown to the Schoolhouse Rock Ministry over the past five years. It's been almost five years since we yeah. <laughs> interviewed you for the movie. We uh, we hope to continue to support your efforts. Yeah. And, uh, it'll be kind of exciting to see where this goes with the movie and then, you know, what else the Hamptons may end up doing after right. Who knows? this marathon is <laughs> completed. Take a breather, I'm sure. Right. It's funny. People ask us that all the time. They're like, what next? And we're like, can we just get through this first? And then we'll figure out what the Lord has for us next. So we really don't know. Um, all we know is that we want to continue serving his kingdom and uh, impacting lives for him. So anyway, thank you. You guys have a great rest of your week. We will be back with you on Monday with another fantastic episode. If you have not uh, left a review on the on iTunes for the podcast, please go and do that. Take a few minutes to do that. We would appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye. You're not inadequate. You are perfectly capable. I mean, what is it about a parent that when their child turns five, all of a sudden the parent's no longer a viable option? Like, oh, you're done. Now it's the school's turn. I think the quality of education has steadily deteriorated in America. There is an agenda to steal our children. You feel inadequate because you've been taught by our school system that you're inadequate. We had no frame of reference for homeschooling other than it just seemed like torture. Like why would a sane woman choose to be locked up with her kids for 18 years in a row when a school bus would come and take them away and give you like a nine hour break every day? <laughs> Thank you.
No one knows your child better than you do, and no one loves your child more than you do. And homeschooling changes the game on everything. Homeschooling allows us to say to the child, what sort of life do you want? What sort of God-given dreams, talents, and abilities is he speaking into you? you know, when we think about classroom education and we ask what makes for good education, almost every professional educator will say low student-teacher ratio, teachers who care, good methods, good curriculum. Well, in homeschooling, you get the best of all of those things. What we discovered is that it's very efficient to homeschool. You have the person who knows the student the best. You have the ability to customize the curriculum around the student. You have a great student-teacher ratio. And I realized I am accomplishing with Sierra in 25 minutes to an hour every day what is taking the school system eight hours a day, five days a week to accomplish with my older daughter. I loved watching the, the light bulb come on and watching her want to sit down and read with me. And I loved spending time with her. There's just so many benefits, including being able to have a relationship with your own children. Continue doing what you're doing. Don't give up, because I do believe that homeschool moms are America's greatest heroes.